For a donation of $50 or more by Labor Day, September 2nd, we'll send you an autographed copy of my latest book, We Praise You, O God. Make a secure online gift at thewordendoors.org or make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. And we'll send you, We Praise You, O God. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, dedicated to translating and publishing the books of our Lutheran faith into more than 100 languages for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Learn how you can take part in their work at lhfmissions.org. If there was a one-stop shop resource for Advent and Lent, wouldn't you want to know? Well, there is. It's the Center for Biblical Studies from Concordia University, St. Paul, led by Dr. Reed Lessing. I'm Pastor Matthew Tuman, and I speak from experience, having used these preaching workshops. Offered online and recorded, they have it all. Sermons, slides, liturgical resources, and Bible studies. All for $25. Learn more at one.csp.edu forward slash Center for Biblical Studies. Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. In temporal trouble and in every terror of conscience, we must listen to Him who simply promises, I am your salvation. He's our secret weapon against the enemy. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse -verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of Psalms, chapters 1 through 41. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. I'm sure you recall the last time we wrapped up Psalm 34. David confessed that the eyes of the Lord were always on the righteous. His ears were ever attentive to their cry, while the face of the Lord was dead set against those who were devoted to doing evil, who refused to turn from it. And God has determined to cut off the memory of the rebellious from the earth. But while it is always true that the Lord hears the righteous, the justified, as they cry out to him, and that he always grants them deliverance, there are times that the deliverance does not come by way of avoiding trouble and pain, but in going directly through it and enduring it. We saw that that was the case with the righteous man, with Jesus, who prayed in the garden for deliverance from the terrifying cup of divine wrath, and he did indeed receive deliverance, but not from drinking it. Rather, after he drained its contents, the Father delivered him by resurrection from the dead. So, don't be discouraged if what you pray for doesn't show up in this age. The fulfillment of our desires actually awaits us on the day of the resurrection. Then, we'll all be praying Psalm 103 together, and we'll see the truth of it. He has forgiven all our sins, and He has healed all our diseases. In the meantime, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and crushed spirits. The righteous, the justified, they have great and many afflictions in this age, but the Lord promises to deliver us out of them all. Remember how John 19 pointed to not one of his, that is the righteous man's, bones would be broken as fulfilled in Jesus, not having his legs broken on the cross. So affliction for the Christian is temporary, but the redemption is eternal. For the one who opposes Christ, the pleasures are temporary, and the affliction is eternal. The justified know that they have taken refuge in the Lord, so they cannot be condemned. The opening verses of the 35th Psalm, beginning with the first one of David. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight with those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. 
Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind, with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery, with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause they hid their net for me. Without cause they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. And let the net he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his destruction. Psalm 35, verses 1 through 8. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that you bruised the head of the old serpent and delivered us from his power. And because you have purchased us with your holy blood, keep us as your own and suffer not the enemy to seduce our hearts. Let your angels war against those who seek our soul and drive them far from us. For you, Lord Jesus, live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to ponder together the opening of Psalm 35? Let's work through it. Verse 1 of David. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Both the Hebrew text and the Greek have the simple ascription of David. 16th century reformer Martin Luther introduced this psalm with these words. The 35th psalm is a psalm of prayer in which David cries out against the shameful people who for the sake of their enjoyment and profit, put up a pretense and say what the rulers would gladly hear. They defame the innocent, embittering the rulers against them and inciting them to violence. They devour the truth and cause great heartache. This happened to David under Saul, his king, when those whom he had treated well often afflicted him. This psalm is the first of the imprecatory or cursing psalms that we'll study, And it is, by all accounts, a relatively mild version of those. Just wait till we have to tackle Psalm 109. One important key to unlocking the imprecatory psalms is to hear them as aimed at the enemies of the gospel, particularly the demonic spirits. That's how many of the fathers read this psalm, as you can hear in 5th century monk Cassiodorus. Listen, this has reference to the devil and his followers through whom sprouted the evil of the Jews' willfulness. Since he himself commands us to pray for our enemies, this statement cannot aptly be referred to people. So he begs that they be damned, who by the power of his prescience he knows cannot attain the remedies of repentance. For in what follows? When he turns to people, he begs that they may be converted rather than perish. I think that's a great way to pray this psalm asking for the Lord's help and defense against the demons and Satan and also the sin in our flesh, everything that fights against our true life in Christ. Verse 2, take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. I think we know what a shield is. A buckler, it's a shield too, but it's a smaller one. David and through him Christ in the Christian, pray for God to arm us for the battle, to hurry to our aid. In Psalm 91, David speaks of the Lord's shield and buckler like this. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. God's faithfulness, his keeping of his promises, is what protects us from the harm that the demonic foes want to inflict upon us. Verse 3. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. The mention of spear and javelin together might remind you of the words that David, as a young lad, spoke to the giant Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you In the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. What does it mean, though, that God says to our soul, I am your salvation? St. Augustine wrote in the 5th century, I will seek no salvation other than the Lord my God. Let us call on him, brothers and sisters, and to open our spiritual ears so that we may hear him saying, I am your salvation. He says it. But some of us are getting deaf. 
so that when we find ourselves in trouble, we prefer to listen to the enemies that harry us. Ouch, and how true. In temporal trouble and in every terror of conscience, we must listen to him who simply promises, I am your salvation. He's our secret weapon against the enemy. Verse 4. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Again, rather than just hearing this against any earthly enemies, let us hear it aimed squarely at the demons and their snares. This is exactly what we pray for in the great hymn known as St. Patrick's Breastplate. Against the demon snares of sin, the vice that gives temptation force, the natural lusts that war within, the hostile foes that mar my course, or few or many, far or nigh, in every place and in all hours, against their fierce hostility, I bind to me those holy powers. Verse 5. Let them be like chaff before the wind, with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Verse 6. Let their way be dark and slippery, with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Chaff, of course, was the light hull of the grain that had been beaten. After threshing or beating it, the ancients would toss the grain up into the air with winnowing forks and let the wind carry away the worthless hull as the precious kernels, far heavier, fell back down to the ground. You recall that in Psalm 34, the angel of Yahweh encamps around those who fear him? Well... Here, you get to see the angel in action, chasing the demonic foes away, putting them to rout on their dark and slippery paths. It's in this spirit that the church prays in Compline, prayer at the close of the day, visit our dwellings, O Lord, and drive from them all the snares of the enemy. Let your holy angels dwell with us to preserve us in peace, and let your blessing be on us always through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 7, for without cause they hid their net for me, without cause they dug a pit for my life. This verse speaks of humanity as it was prior to the fall. We'd done nothing to the devil and his hordes. Yet, in the garden already, the evil one marked us out as his prey. Some of the fathers speculate it, and it is just speculation, that perhaps that's why God didn't provide a redemption for the evil spirits and the way he did for humanity, they fell on their own with no tempter. We, however, were led astray and seduced into sin by them and their lies. Verse 8. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it, and let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his destruction. The 4th century ascetical writer, Evagrius of Pontus saw in this verse a direct reference to the cross. He wrote, I think this speaks about the cross, on which the devil falls unknowingly. For if he had known, never would he have affixed the Lord of glory to the cross. I love how St. Romanus the Melodus from the 6th century captured this tricking of the devil in a weird conversation between Hades, or death, and Satan. It goes like this. Pilate fixed three crosses on Golgotha, two for the thieves and one for the giver of life. When hell saw it, he said to those below, My ministers and powers, who has fixed a nail in my heart? A wooden lance has suddenly pierced me, and I'm being torn apart. My insides are in pain. My belly is in agony. My senses make my spirit tremble, and I'm compelled to disgorge Adam and Adam's race. All men were given to me by the garden's tree. But now a tree is bringing them back to paradise. When he heard this, Satan, the cunning serpent, ran crawling and said, What is it, Hell? Why do you groan for no reason? Why produce these wailings? This tree at which you tremble, I carpentered up there for Mary's child. I suggested it to his enemies for our advantage, for it is a cross to which I have nailed Christ, wishing by a tree to do away with the second Adam, just as I did away with the first one. So do not be afraid. It is dry and barren. It will not harm you. Keep hold of those you have. Of those we rule, not one will escape again to paradise. 
<laughs> the, the poem delightfully goes back and forth like that till Hades finally convinces Satan that he's made a huge goof in the crucifixion of the Son of God. It's a real classic. But that's where we're going to stop for today on the 35th Psalm. Next time, we'll work through the middle section of the psalm where David contrasts the treatment he's received from his enemies with his own behavior toward them, begging God to rescue him from their plots. Till next time, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.